Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinSlift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at FunkinStuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version, from providers like iTunes and Spotify. As always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get, uh, early premieres, and it's all free, so make sure you sign up, tell a friend, tell family. Also get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here, Truth and Rhythm shirts, Show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. I um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. I am honored to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership Victor Wooden, a composer, producer, multi-instrumentalist who is best known as one of the most accomplished bass players of his generation. First bursting onto the radar of adventurous music lovers in 1990 with the eclectic bluegrass meets jazz fusion of Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, he would go on to not only perform on more than a dozen Fleck albums, but also establish himself as a top shelf solo artist and collaborator with music that spans jazz, funk, rock, soul, world music, and more, Wooden has captured five Grammys and is a three-time recipient of Bass Player Magazine's Bass Player of the Year Award. As if that were not enough, he is also an educator and inspiration to aspiring musicians everywhere. Victor, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, Scott. Thanks for having me on your show. My pleasure. Thanks for being on. And uh, where are you coming to us from today? Nashville, Tennessee, my home. Yeah. And is that where you're from originally? No, no. I've been here since ni the end of 1988, and I lived in Virginia before that, California before that, Hawaii before that, born in Idaho, you know, military family. Ah, yeah. So you're all over the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, so you settled in the uh, Music City area, which uh, yeah. is neighboring me. I'm just over uh, in North Carolina, so... Yeah, what part? Near Charlotte, just north of Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, I have lots of, lots of friends and relatives in that area. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy it. Been here 12 years and uh, from Los right. Angeles as well. So. Okay. Well, that's a different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how you been holding up, you know, with all this craziness? I know I've seen you on a lot of the Zooms and a lot of the, you know, Berkeley-based stuff and a lot of cool things. You've been keeping busy for sure, but how you holding up? I'm holding up very well. Scott, um, I'm, I'm actually thriving, you know, at, at the risk of sounding disrespectful to people who aren't thriving. Um, I am. I haven't been home like this um, in, in, at all in my kids' lives. My oldest is close to 23. My youngest is 15. And I've been touring their whole lives. You know, ever since they could talk, if whenever I would come home, it was like, Dad, how long are you home this time? Or mm -hmm. when do you have to leave again? You know, and that, that kind of stuff digs at you. But finally, you know, I can keep my calendar on day view and just see what do I have today? Uh, nothing. OK, cool. 
So it's 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 really been nice, but you know, I say that relatively because well, for one, for one of the reasons that it's nice is because I've made good, some good decisions in the past, so I can kind of live off of some past things that I've done that are that are helping keeping my family and me afloat. Not everybody has that luxury. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I I make my living doing what I love. Not everybody has that luxury. Uh, I realize how fortunate I am, but I also realize how much hard work I've put into it since I was two years old to get to this point. I recognize the family and upbringing that I had that helped keep my mind strong and pure so that I could uh, handle the successes and the accolades that you were talking about and still be a family man. Um, But uh, a long answer to, for me, kind of a simple question. I'm doing very, very well. And I do think that the better off I can be, the more I can help others. And that's why you've seen me online a lot, more than I thought I'd ever be, is because I want to reach out to people and, and kind of help them cope through these uh, different times, you know, definitely different for our generation. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm very glad to hear that you're, you know, making such uh Good results out of a uh, challenging situation for Manny, for sure. And um, you know, I'm curious. You know, I know your your family, your brothers, and you're so musical. Are, are your kids musical at all? Yeah, all four of them are musical. The older three, um, you know, they they perform. Whether they do music as their livelihood, that'll be up to them. But they do perform. The the youngest one could be the most musical out of all of them. You know how it is, being the youngest, it all trickles down. You kind of grow up with great examples. That's how it happened with me. But my youngest has no desire to perform in son- in front of anyone, mm. unless he's on like a sports field. He- his thing right now is soccer, you know? And he's he loves to perform on the soccer field. He's really great at it, but he's really musical. So sometimes he'll sneak down here and get on the piano make some little recordings of himself you know he'll think nobody's listening Mm. and he sings as he's doing homework he dances when no one's looking that kind of thing very musical good ear good voice but he has no desire of performing Mm. again a long answer to a simple question yes all four of them are very musical how could they not be yeah that's some musical dna man wow um What was it like for you coming up, you know, in that kind of environment yourself? And, and what directed you to the bass specifically? Well, I'll start with the, the second question. My brother Reggie started me on the bass. My three older brothers, Reggie, Roy, and Rudy. That's the oldest in age. Reggie, guitar, Roy, now also known as Future Man with Bela Fleck and the Flectones. He's a drummer. Roy. And Rudy's our saxophone playing brother. We lost him about 10 years ago. Sadly, way too young. And Joseph's a keyboard player. He's been playing with the Steve Miller Band since 1993. So they were already playing. The three older ones, Reggie, Roy, and Rudy, were only a a year apart from each other. Actually, Reggie and Roy are less than a year apart from each other. And Rudy only 13 months later came. So got three boys, three baby boys, only two years apart. For some reason, and this is the real question, how they started, they started playing music. And then when Joseph was young, Reggie started teaching Joseph keyboards. And so even before I was born, they already knew this is the bass player. <laughs> All right. So when I was about two years old, Reggie would put a toy in my hands and they'd start jamming. And I, so I'd bounce around strumming this toy, acting like my brothers. So the same way you, you learned English without trying, without much. Well, I, you tried, but it was not much effort. Right? You just did it because everyone else was doing it and everyone else included you. You were never excluded. Right? You were never told when you were wrong when you said wrong words as a baby. Right? You jammed with your language. You jammed with professionals all the time. You know, with your language in English, you weren't forced to talk to other people who didn't know any more than you like we do with music. We put beginners with beginners and expect them to get good right away. You got good within a few years with English because you jammed with the pros. I got good at music right away because I was jamming with pros, even though my oldest pro was only eight years older than me. Hmm. So the real question is, how does Reggie get so good? How does Reggie get so good that he can teach me and Joseph well enough that in three short years, 
when I'm about five, close to six, we're on tour, mm-hmm. opening for Curtis Mayfield on the West Coast. We're living in California now, going up and down the West Coast, opening for Curtis Mayfield Superfly Tour, the Wooten Brothers. So I tell people that, and, and I get the credit. But Reggie, think about that. What 10-year-old do you know who can teach his little brothers to be that good that quickly to be on a national tour? Wow. Reggie, right? Hmm. You know, I'll take the credit, but I'm always going to get on 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 your show and talk about my brothers. Yeah. Because they deserve the credit. So that's how it happened for me. So growing up with it was identical to you learning English. You didn't even know you were learning it. It was just something you did. Music was just something I did every day. It wasn't anything different, special. It was just even when I finally started school, come home, do homework, take a nap on a Friday, play the gig Friday night. It's just what it was. Wow. I can see it now for what it was. I can see it now. Back then, it's what we did. Were you guys playing like top 40 stuff or R&B or what kind of material? Absolutely. All of the above. You'll have to remember when we were young, pop music just meant popular music. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there were funk stations, R&B stations, gospel stations, rock stations, jazz, classical. But the pop stations played it all as long as it was popular. So the top 40 might be, you know, take five, might be take the A train. But then it might be James Brown, then it might be the Beatles, then it might be Led Zeppelin. All on the same station. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're playing it all. But we mostly got called to play black clubs and black functions that wanted to hear R&B music and soul music, Motown, Curtis Mayfield, Temptations, Aretha Franklin, stuff like that. So we played mostly that in the clubs, but at home and when we got the opportunity, we played everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what was wonderful about back then. You could get such a melting pot of influences, you know, just right off the airwaves. Right. And the radio was allowed to play it. Yeah. Our DJs could turn you on to the new stuff. That's how we found out. Now we have to search for it on our own on the Internet. And we're lucky we have all the options. But back then, a DJ could say, hey, here's this new thing I sound, found. Boom, boom, boom. And you're like, man, you're calling the station. Who was that you just played? You know, it was a fun time. Then you'd go out and buy the record. Yeah. Right. We wouldn't just buy the single. We would buy the whole album, listen to both sides of it, read every word on the credit. And we do it with our friends or family. Yeah. We didn't just put on headphones and listen to ourselves. It was a, a group event. What a time to be alive. Yeah, it was an experience. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, yep. Who were some of the um, early influences on you bass wise outside of your brothers? Oh, man. Well, I can't see all that's behind you, but it looks like you got a lot of them on the wall behind you. I see everything on the one uh, that, you know, that's a Clinton uh, uh, Bootsy and before that James Brown type stuff so all of that stuff of course Motown you know Motown was happening at the same time as the Beatles so I was more in the Motown than I was the Beatles I really I of course I was a, I was aware of them didn't learn much of the music you know but you couldn't help but hear it and I got into the Beatles when I joined Bela Fleck and he uh was really a big big Beatles fan so I started listening to Paul McCartney then but I was much older but bass wise I was influenced by the greats before I knew who they were or before I even cared who they were. You know, when you're eight years old, you're not thinking about what this bass player's name was. I mean, I wasn't back in the, in the early 70s, right? 73, I'm in the fifth grade, eight years old or whatever. Th- no, 73, I'm in the third grade and I'm eight years old. I don't know that that's James Jamerson. Mm-hmm. You know, the first one of the first bass players that really caught my attention by name my aunt turned me on to my mom's younger sister was listen uh, she turned us brothers on to a donny hathaway live record Mm. uh the last song called everything is everything and willie weeks takes a bass solo and my aunt says boy you gotta listen to this and so that's one of the first bass players by name that i can remember but some earlier ones were larry graham 
when he was with Sly Stone, and all of a sudden he came out with the, the thumping style that people now call slapping. I was like, what? How? What? Who's doing? What? How? How you get in that sound? Oh, that's Larry Graham. Larry Graham. Then Stanley Clark came on the scene with Return to Forever. Knocked my socks off. Marcus Miller started making his name because he was a great bass player, but he was producing all this R and B stuff. Then he started producing, you know, he was producing Luther Andro Luther Vandross and all this stuff. Then he started producing Miles. And I'm like, he's a bass player. Then we had TV shows back then. Right? We had TV shows where you could see the great musicians, the Midnight Special, Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, Soul Train, American Bandstand. Right? And then David Sanborn, I think, had a had a show with Marcus on bass and Hiram Bullock. Great stuff, right? So the name started to mean more to me. But you got to think I'm still young. I'm still young now. I'm hearing and seeing all these people. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Jocko comes on the scene. Jocko Pistorius. I mean, you know, I don't remember anything. I don't remember any, any bass player having such a unique sound on the instrument. Stanley, of course, was unique. Larry Graham, of course, was unique. But it was still funky. It was still what I was growing up with. When Jocko came on the scene, for me, it was totally different. Not so much better, but different. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the top of level, as good as it can get, but different. And I had to learn it. You know, playing whole songs on harmonics sound like a piano. I'm like, well, if that's a bass, that means I can do it too, because I got a bass. So I grew. Every time I hear these great people and learn their names, I grow, because I learn everything I can get my hands on. So those are some of the names. Of course, Bootsy Collins with James Brown. But at first, when Bootsy was with James Brown, I didn't really know his name. Mm -hmm. I was just playing music. But as I got into you know, the names, when he was started to become with Parliament, and it's like, oh, that's the same guy that was with James Brown, Bootsy. And uh, Bootsy wasn't as flamboyant as he was when he was with Parliament. And George helped him get his whole thing together. And then Bootsy's rubber band, and Larry Graham had Green Central Station, you know, a lot of, lot of great players. And now I'm familiar with tons of them. You know, of course, James Jamerson, Chuck Rennie, Bob Babbitt, Duck Dunn, Carol Kay. There's a ton that was playing the music that was the, the soundtrack to our childhood, man. Well, because you've been a student of it ever since then. So, yeah. And, and believe it or not, I was a student of it then and didn't know it. Because I had to learn those songs. Reggie was teaching me those parts. And then when I'm about, definitely when the fusion scene hit in the mid 70s, early 70s. So now I'm third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. And now we're playing this Return to Forever stuff. Mahavishnu, Billy Cobham, Spectrum, John McLaughlin. Now Reggie's not teaching me my parts anymore. I got to put the record on or make a cassette and learn these parts myself. So for some of it, I'm still in single digits or early double digits, 10, 11, and 12. And my ears getting really good because I've got to put, I've got to figure this stuff out on my own. So, I, I didn't call myself a student, but I look back at it and realize how much of a student I was. Like a sponge. Built, yeah, <laughs> soaking it all up. That student. Yeah. What do you remember the first time on stage you were able to kind of step forward and do a solo? Yeah, I was very very young. Um, I can remember. Even even in our, our Curtis Mayfield days, when I was five or six, Reggie would get, teach me these routines to do. Um, like I've got posters here that says featuring, you know, the Victor Wooten, the eight-year-old bass ace. Hmm. And these posters, now we're living in Virginia and playing up the coast there, North Carolina a lot, and I'm eight and nine. But I'll, they, Reggie, you know, he always organized a spot for me in the show where all of a sudden, you know, I step out front and I'd put up one finger and I'd lay the bass on the floor and play it like this, like a piano. And then I'd put up number two and I'd stand it out. I'd be on one knee and the bass is taller than me and I'm playing it like an upright. Then I'd put up three and I'd pick it up and play it behind my head, you know. Hmm. And this is all stuff Reggie taught me. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that showmanship early. Very much, very much. And if you think about the bands we grew up on, they understood uh, the art of performance, right? The Rolling Stones, right? Any of those people. Of course, you couldn't even get through Motown 
without going through performance school. Right? He would, uh, Barry Gordy and his team would groom you. So I grew up on the Jackson Five, the Temptations. Parliament was a show. Earth, Wind, and Fire was a show. And uh, James Brown, the best show ever. James Brown. So we grew up as performers. We didn't just play the music. We performed it. Yeah. And so I've always had that uh, mentality, even even today. I understand that people can hear good music at home. But if they're going to pay to come see me, we need to give them something to see and give them more than what they can get at home. So I understand the art of performing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks to my brothers. Yeah. So, uh, Vic, what transpired that led to you and your brothers eventually getting a, a record deal with Arista? And what went into that whole process? Yeah, uh, it was a learning process. When we were living in Virginia, actually it started in California. Um, you know, we, we became known, of course, we've got little five little br brothers who can play. You know, we were, we were good, not to brag, but it's just the truth, we were good. So we got attention. And so if Curtis Mayfield came to town, needed an opening act, we gotta get the Wooten brothers. So when we left California and moved back to Virginia, uh, you know, Virginia and North Carolina is where my grandparents are from. We were opening shows again. And eventually we opened some shows for, uh, we caught the attention of a singer named Stephanie Mills. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Mills was- uh, From the Wiz originally. She was Dorothy in the original yeah. Wiz on Broadway, exactly. She had, uh, well, she liked us and she was gonna discover the Wooten brothers. But she had a keyboard player at the time. His name was Kashif. Mm -hmm. Kashif was a big time R&B producer. Produced so many people back in the 80s. Evelyn Champagne King, Lilo Thomas, George Benson, Whitney Houston's first record, which my brothers Roy and Joseph are on that first record. He produced so many people. And when he was with Stephanie playing keys, he told us, he said, you know what? I'm working on a production deal. If, if it comes through, I want to get you guys on my production company. And we're like, yeah, okay. You know, we heard that many times from people. But it happened. We ended up signing a deal with his publishing company to do a record for Arista. So Kashif was producing us. He was producing uh, a record for Kenny G at the same time. And he was producing this uh, beautiful model who could sing, this black model. And her name just happened to be Whitney Houston. So he was producing all three of our records at the same time. Um, but kind of un unfortunate, I guess, for us is that uh, Whitney and Kenny had their own deals with Clive and Arista. Our deal was through Kashif's company, the new music group was through his company. So we kind of weren't direct with Arista, it was through him. And our deal didn't go the way it should have. Um, and that's the best, nicest way to put it. We learned a lot. You know, I've got a copy of the album, but what we had to go through to get the album to even come out. Um, because, you know, it, I, the album may not have ever come out. There were some behind the scene things that was really going on with that deal. But in the end, we came out better because of it. Made, uh, you know, a lot of experience, made a lot of connections, a lot of deals. Some people that we're still in touch with came through that. Um, Kashif, a talented man, but not 100% honest, uh, has since passed away. Sorry about that. Um, and we owe him a lot. Um, you know, even though he did take a lot from us, um, but he taught us a lot, good and bad. And we're better off in life and we're, we understand music a whole lot more because of those experiences. And, you know, Arista Records doesn't even exist anymore, mm -hmm. but the Wooten brothers do. <laughs> so, you know, it, it could have been a good thing that we didn't reach that success at that time. How did you feel about the record itself in terms of, you know, was that the kind of uh, direction that you and your brothers wanted to go? Or were you kind of steered that way? Or We were definitely steered that way. And uh, not to speak for Kenny G, but at the time, Kenny was the same way. You know, they were, uh, they were trying to make Kenny into this kind of like soul sax player, you know. 
and Kenny wanted to do the smooth stuff he's doing now. You know, so they'd have a, you know, a soul singer on his records, and then Kenny would take a sax solo. So everybody thought Kenny G was black because they had this black singer. You know, but finally he convinced the record label, hey, look, just let me do half my record my way. And all of a sudden Songbird comes out and and now and then we like pretty much half smooth jazz after that. You know, he was the one that really put it on the map. There was some smooth stuff with Grover Washington, Mr. Magic and people like that. But Kenny really put it on the map because they were steering him in a way that wasn't him. So again, a long answer is no, the record didn't go quite the way we wanted it to go. Uh, it was a good record, but it sounded more like Kashif than it did us. But the good, the good thing is that Kashif had developed a sound in the 80s, bouncing mini move bass. He really had a sound, these tight harmonized background vocals. He created a sound and our record was that sound. Not so much us, very little electric bass on it. You have to listen with a magnifying glass to even find the electric bass. My brother Rudy, very little of Rudy playing sax, you know, but it is a well-produced Kashif record and, and we did it. No one can take that from us. You know, there's a few copies floating around. And again, we learned a whole lot about the studio because Kashif was a genius in the studio. Yeah. And we got to, you know, sit around and learn a lot and, and make friends. Again, some still people that people that we still keep in touch with. I think uh, people would be surprised if they haven't heard it, if they know you today or through the years to hear that version of, of Victor Wooden, you know, because it's definitely quite a bit different from, you know, what you would go on to do with all the fusion experimental and much more adventurous and diverse types of music. Yeah, yeah, I, I get called now to do that mostly because of Bela Fleck and the Flectones. And even though our brothers were playing fusion and stuff like that, you know, we were really doing a lot of R&B and soul stuff. You know, rock, we love everything. But for me, I'm I'm a number one an R&B bass player. I just wanted to groove, or maybe a funk bass player. I wanted to feel good. I want to support, you know, my instrument is designed to support other people. But with Bela Fleck and the Flectones, that's where the, the world started to know me. And, and Bela uh, let me exercise the, the, the crazier side of my playing. You know, because when I was young, you know, I won a bass contest competition in, in, uh, in Virginia when I was young. Not so much because I was the best player, but I, I won because of the performance. You know, I was spinning my bass around my neck. I actually did a back handspring with the bass on, you know, all this kind of stuff that got everybody's attention. Totally different than the other people. And when I brought that to the Flectones, Beta was the kind of band leader that utilized it. He wasn't afraid of it. He wasn't like, no, it's my band. He gave, he would give me a spot every night to do whatever I wanted. He would just take a back seat and sometimes leave the stage. And when that caught people's attention, I became known for that. Even though every time I play, most of my night is playing bass lines, backing up people. But the performance was so strong that that's what people went home remembering. So I became known for that, even though I know myself first as being a support bass player. But I mean, in talking with you, Vic, I mean, it definitely stems back all the way to that six or eight year old, you know, being able to come out on stage like that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of coming full circle in a way with that um, sounds like. It, it is, it is. And especially with the Flectones being able to play in the band for over 30 years with one of my older brothers, Roy, future man, right? We understand each other totally. We understand performing. It's like we've been on the same team my whole life. So we can bounce off of each other right away. We have this whole non-verbal com uh, communication and conversation going on even if we're on different sides of the stage. So I, I do say this, everything I get credit for, I point back to my brothers. I give them credit, them and my parents, because our parents gave us the way of thinking. The invincible, don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Don't, any, don't let anyone stop you from doing it. But whatever it is that you're doing, do it at the height possible. Mm -hmm. But it needs to make the world better, not just you. 
right? My parents were adamant about that. I don't care how good you got, get on the bass guitar. What's that got to do with me? My mom would say, mm -hmm. how's that make, how's that help me? How's that make the world better? So we had to be able to see that as kids, that if we're going to spend this time, this money, this effort, put all this energy into doing something, I shouldn't be the only one benefiting from it, all right? So my brothers all have that mentality because we grew up with it. It's not that we're trying to do that. That's just an innate part of my upbringing. So being able to perform over 30 years with one of my brothers. Oh, the other thing I, I didn't mention about the, the Arista thing is that was the, uh, the cause of the five brothers not playing together for the first time ever. So it was a pretty sad down time for me mm. being a young. And I grew up my whole life playing in a band with my brothers, and now we're not together. What ended up happening is, is Kashif would go out on tour, and he would use Roy and Joseph on drums and keys. And what a great opportunity. Travel the world, you know, at a high level, playing with them and George Benson and all these different people they get to tour with. And, you know, recording on records and, you know, Kenny G's records, uh, Whitney's records. Great thing. But then the other three of us are just kind of stuck at home trying to figure out what else we can do. And all we really know is music, mm. you know. So, um, you know, in the end, we were better off because being forced to learn how to play with other people. It was just like when you when you move out the house for the first time, you start to grow up, you become a better human, a human a more complete human because you're not only living under the umbrella of your family. So when I started learning how to play with other musicians, that's eventually what led me to Bela Fleck. And I, I ended up recommending my brother Roy when Bela was asking for a drummer mm -hmm. and I'm a much better musician because of it. Yeah. Um, well, I think most of us are glad it did work out that way, despite the trials and tribulations at the time. You know, but uh, Vic, you're talking about, you know, bringing something more than, you know, just the bass to the people. And it's the feel and the pleasure and the joy that it brings. But at the same time, you know, a lot of the music was so adventurous and challenging, like a Bella Fleck and that kind of music. So where's the dividing line in your mind between... You know, music that's for the listener and music that's for the musician to accomplish something and, you know, finding a balance with that uh, adventure and challenge, but still being for listeners. Sure. Um, it's it's both. What One of the things that we found with Bela is that if we do something that's true to us, we will have listeners. Right. And it may not be as, as many as the Rolling Stones. But we will have enough listeners that we can sustain what we what we love to do. And what I found is that if you're really honest about whatever it is, you can like butterfly wings. And nowadays it's easy, so easy to reach other people around the world who also like butterfly wings. And if you become so knowledgeable about that, you're going to have followers. Right? Well, music already touches people. Right? Physically, mentally and spiritually touches people. And when you are honest about it, people can understand that honesty. The same way you can see kids playing music and the music may not sound that good, but you see how honest they are and how much fun they're having that you can get into it. Your own kids, you know, your kid comes home from elementary school with that hand painting. It's not beautiful, you know, but it's still on the refrigerator because it is beautiful, right? You're not looking at what came out. You, you can see what went into it, right? So. When you do anything that way, you will have an audience. But in the, in the spirit of a Stevie Wonder who will write a song everybody can sing, but then when you go to learn it and analyze it, you realize there's a whole lot of theory, jazz harmony, all kinds of stuff behind it. So he's educate, educating people whether we know it or not. Bela Fleck and the Flecktones were sort of like that, right? We could have a song that's like a sinister, the song Sinister Minister that was became pretty popular because uh, we had a video and it, and it aired on TV quite a bit. There's some stuff, different types of chords, 
the way the D minor chords are moving up through diminished scales and things like that. And that, that line that comes down, da, 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 what scale is that, you know? But you can, people can still feel that funk beat Roy put behind it. The funkiness of the thumb. I'm just doing what I grew up on, right? But I'm putting what I grew up on underneath Bela's genius of writing. And Bela doesn't hear music like anyone else, right? He writes this weird stuff. But when we put a song like Sinister Minister or Sunset Road, which is almost like an R&B ballad with some little things hidden in there, all this kind of stuff. And then at the time, you're still buying the whole record, you know, when this stuff was first coming out. So surrounding that is some other stuff that's going to stretch your brain a little bit. But then you go, that's kind of cool. I don't know what to call it, but that's kind of neat, you know. It sometimes has to grow on you, too. You got to listen to it repeatedly. Right, right, exactly. So Bela understands that. A Stevie Wonder understands that. And any <clears throat> artist of that day understood that. They put on the pop song to get you to listen to this other one. You know, uh, James Brown did that a lot. You listen to a whole James Brown record, and he's going to have Sex Machine and all that kind of stuff. But then you go and listen, he's going to have another song that's laying down some deep knowledge. You know, like James Brown, sometimes people say he's one of the first rappers mm -hmm. because he would just talk through some of the songs with rhymes. and But the stuff was heavy, especially for black people. You know, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Right. Listen to the lyrics. Right. That wasn't the number one hit, but it's on the album, you know. So Bela is sort of like that. You know, we can put out some songs that the, the radio can play. We can make a video for but then there's some other stuff that's going to lift you a little bit higher, too, you know. And I like that. I like that a person back then could make an album and put different types of things on it. Nowadays, people won't even buy that. They're just going to download the one song they like, and then they'll say they heard the album. <laughs> yeah, I, I hated this movement towards singles over albums. But, uh, you know, like um, we were talking about, you know, I go back to it being a total experience, and it's a such an important um appreciation of the art form that's kind of been lost a little bit but uh you know through this show and through the music you do you know we try to keep promoting that um i appreciate it too yeah people like you that support people like me you know because we i play music regardless of what anybody thinks but i have a career as a musician because of people like you Right, because of people who make sure that other people know about it and people who buy it and support my records and give and vote me these awards. They're the reason I have a career. Right? Because I'm just a musician anyway. So I, I thank you. That all that is to say thank you for doing what you do for people like us to get our name, our music, and our, our word out there. And not just the hit songs, but all the music. I appreciate you for that. Oh, so glad I can can be a part of it. Um, so, Victor, how did it come about that you launched your solo career? And, you know, at what point, if at any, did you sort of visualize or aspire that you would be in a band, that maybe you would go solo? You know, what did you envision for your musical career back in, say, the 80s or early 90s? And has that gone to plan or, or what? Yeah, it's 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 really going to plan. I think it's going better than plan. Uh, my o my overall goal when I finally decided to do it was just to get a record out there. Um, growing up with four of the greatest musicians in the world, I learned how to do different things on my bass. I would steal piano techniques from my brother Joseph and and play the bass with two hands. Chords on the bass, like playing a guitar, makes sense. So I would get I learned chords from Reggie. You know, he could pick up the bass and immediately play chords. So I would learn that from him. Larry Graham showed us how to use our thumb to get kick and snare sounds so while playing rhythms. I would learn drum rudiments from Roy. Right? A saxophone is played vertically. The hands go up and down. But if you lay it sideways, it looks just like a guitar. So being able to get ideas from my brother Rudy, right, who actually played two saxes most of his life. He played two at a time. Like Rasan Roland Kurt. So this is how I grew up with a saxophone playing brother, playing two at a time, harmonies. So, you know, I would experiment playing two basses at a time. 
So I would always borrow and steal from my brothers. So I had learned a lot of solo pieces. My brother Joseph could get on the piano and play a whole song and sing along. I mean, you hear the chords, the bass part, the melody, the rhythm. Bass players are known for playing one note at a time. I wanted to play the whole song. Reggie could do it on the guitar. So I learned how to do it. And I was learning Stevie Wonder songs, which are always more challenging than you thought. The melody's simple. The chord, wow, what's going on, you know? But I learned how to play some stuff. So now I'm with Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Bela's given me the chance to do that on stage. Now, he hadn't seen any bass players doing this, so he wanted the world to see it. He would move back and let me do it. So I'm doing all this stuff. Then I ended up getting a job when I finally moved to Nashville. Um, I'm paying rent for the first time. I mean, I had to make money. And, you know, so the gig gigging life wasn't paying rent. So I ended up getting a job playing dinner music at a health food restaurant. And so I basically really enhanced or developed my solo bass playing. You know, because I can't just get up there while you're eating and, and play some funk slap stuff, you know. I needed to play you could stuff. for me, but yeah, that's just me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for you, you might have enjoyed it. But uh, I found a different way of playing. Being able to play music that you hear, but you don't have to listen to. The softer side, the chordal side, the sweet side. And then I thought, man, I wonder if I can make a whole record of this stuff. Because I could do it without overdubs, you know? And so the idea came, I mean, I had done a few records with Bela already. And I started thinking, can I make a record that's just bass, no overdubs, just one four string bass? Can I make a record that somebody won't get tired of hearing in, you know, what, however long an album is, 35 minutes or something? Can I do that? And so I tried it. And once I got once I got the recording that I thought, wow, this is actually, this is something. I wonder if anyone will put it out. Because people weren't putting out their own stuff in the whatever, early 90s. So I found a local label here in Nashville, Tennessee that put it out for me. And surprise to me, the bass players and other musicians flipped out over it. They were like, wow, you know, never heard this. And, and so that was the idea first, can I do this? Can I make a record with just a four string bass and no other instrument, no overdubs that someone will actually listen to? And so I was happy uh, when I was successful at that and still surprised at how many people still look back at, at that record as a pivotal point in their careers. Yeah, we're talking about a show of hands in, in 1996. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, you have to think, it came out in 96. That means it was recorded probably 94. You know, because I had to just do it myself on some ADATs, you know, recording eight track machine. And then once I get it done and mixed, now I got to shop it around. Does anybody want anybody else like this? So it took a while, it took a few years. And then it finally came out. And, uh, and it's, it's been good for me. And you mentioned Stevie Wonder, of course, overjoyed was on there and you've done that more than once i think really on different records yes you know yes. and i don't know if i've ever said i probably never said this on the show but that was actually uh my our wedding song oh wow yeah like you 20 years ago next month so yeah yeah well that's one of them man stevie wonder is a genius a total genius where he can he can hide complexity uh underneath simplicity you know, overjoyed, simple melody. You know, Stevie's, uh, I talk about Stevie when I talk about songwriting a lot. Stevie does these little nursery rhyme tricks that are so simple, but no one catches it except your subconscious. Like Stevie Wonder will repeat something three times. I call it a question where the statement will go up. Overjoyed, da, 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 da. Then it goes down with an answer, da, da, da. Then he does it again, da, 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 two times, three times. Then he goes up, da, 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 right? So it's sort of like Dr. Seuss, simple, really easy that your brain gets it because it's just like talking. Mm -hmm. Now you ask the question, then you answer, right? Just, but then you go and go to learn those chords under there. 
especially when he goes to the bridge. Da 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 now he's somewhere well way totally different but some kind of way he gets back to da, da, da. i still don't know how he does it. i play it but i don't know how it works you know? <laughs> genius he so is a, a genius. beautiful song then the messages are always good stevie's always about positivity earth wind and fire was the same you know so I, i'm glad that i was alive when that music was being born and getting to see all of them perform when they were young earth wind and fire verdine maurice white you know stevie little stevie wonder a young james brown i got to see him perform in first and second grade oh wow. Wow. I, saw you know, was, I i didn't see james i saw the other ones but not james mm. yeah yeah he's the best so you, you you were successful with that and then you decided you know what i'm going to continue making these solo records and i'm going to do some different things with them sure sure one of the main things was that when i when i released a show of hands i really thought the musicality would take precedent songs like overjoyed melodies more love um you know different different things like that the the message on a song like justice um the grooves of you can't hold no groove or me and my bass guitar but bass players seem to be attracted to the technique of it and that coupled with Bela Fleck and the Flecktones performances I became known as a technical player and so I decided on my next records after to go in kind of the opposite direction. The second record was mostly, uh, which was What Did He Say, was mostly myself and my friend J.D. Blair on drums. But then I did have Reggie on guitar, on some stuff, Joseph, started adding a little bit more instruments. And it wasn't just about the bass. And then the next record, Yin and Yang, had a vocal record and an instrumental record. Lots of melodies, you know, Joe's Journey, just a ballad about my friend passing away. You know, so I started trying to point more towards the music and, and, and bass lines. Of course, there's still some flash. I put some fire on there. But um, I kind of went in a, in a different direction when I could have kept going in the same direction. Um, but I didn't want to. I didn't want that to become what bass playing was about, you know. And so, every, really, ever since then, I've gone back in the opposite direction and really looking at what bass is really supposed to do. And then, you know, you put some sprinkles on the cake a little bit and a little flash every now and then, but I didn't make the record about that. So, yeah. yeah, well, the variety is just, you know, one of the fantastic calling cards of your material. At the same time, you were still doing you know some stuff with bella and you're still doing other projects with uh you know the vital tech tones and these kinds mm -hmm. of things so man you know how are you keeping so busy you know i i'm i was very fortunate that out my phone would ring you know um people would call and in min, in most cases i would just say yes um and uh, I got to do some just so much div diverse things. Um, yeah, with Vital Tech Tones, you know, with Steve Smith, who was in a band called Vital Information. And uh, Scott Henderson was in a band called Tribal Tech. And I was in the Fleck Tones. And that's why we got Vital Tech Tones. We just took one part of each of our names and we did a record. And that was a project where we just went into the studio, wrote a song, recorded it that day. Then went to the next song, wrote it, recorded it. And, you know, we come to the studio with nothing and end a week later with that record. And we did that twice. So that was fun. Uh, I got to do a few things where if people heard me play. They wouldn't even know it was me. They heard the record. And I love that. Where I got actually got called to play bass. But a lot of the times people would call me to put some fire on it. And even still today, I rarely get called just to play bass. It's just to, you know, add some solos and fire and Everybody thinks I want a solo. If I'm on their song, they build in a solo. 
And I'm like, this song doesn't need a bass solo, <laughs> you know? But everyone thinks Victor Wooten wants to solo. And technically, I actually, I'd actually rather not, just to put the word out there, I'd rather not solo, you know? But um, I'm just lucky that people like, still like what I do and will call me, you know, to do that. So I've, I've been fortunate. And I thank people like you again. Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones came out at an era where VH1 was new. We were on VH1 a bunch. We had our own show there for a while. Um, you know, Arsenio Hall was a bass fan. So we went on there and we played our bass, most bass feature song, The uh, Sinister Minister, on Arsenio. We did a Tonight Show three times with Johnny Carson and twice with Jay Leno. So, you know, it was a good time for music. We opened for the Grateful Dead, uh, New Year's Eve, Oakland Coliseum. Uh, we opened for the Jerry Garcia band a few times. You know, people were really into to what we were doing and giving us a chance to do it. A great jazz vocal group, Take Six, when, it, when they went on their first tour, Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones was the opening band. We opened for a tour of the band Chicago. You know, I don't know what who paired that up, but we got to do it. So, you know, we came out in a, in a great era. And then when Jerry died, the whole jam band scene was born and we were a part of it. So that's, that helped also. That's what I was going to say. I felt like, you know, Bella and, and you guys were sort of at the beginning of that jam band scene really blossoming. You know? We absolutely were because yeah. Jerry Garcia is a banjo player and a big fan of Bayless. So he was already aware of Bela from his earlier bands. And then when Bela did his own thing, the Flectones, Jerry would hire us to open for the Jerry Garcia band and, and, and on one occasion for the Grateful Dead. And, um, and so when, when Jerry passed away, those fans were looking for places to go. Mm -hmm. and so they started following, you know, Fish, Widespread, Panic, different bands like that. And we were the instrumental version of it of those bands, no vocals. And I really think if, you know, if we had had vocals, if we had been a vocal band, we probably would have been hu you know, much more popular than we are because people love vocals. But I believe that Jerry Garcia and just, you know, the, the, the 90s, the early 90s was a, was a great time, you know, with MTV, VH1. VH1 wanted to be different from MTV. They wanted to spotlight new music and not just play the popular stuff. And we were the one we were one of the bands that they found. So we had a uh, we had three videos that played on their their show a lot. And they even gave us an hour long show where we got to pick the music we wanted to play. And Johnny Carson was still there where he would have you know live music on. And uh, so it was a good good time. You, you know you know Victor I still remember hearing that first uh, Bella Fleck record and not knowing what it was or what to expect. <laughs> and just that first listen, so it was like, wow, this is like something else. I mean, it really yeah. was different at the time. And, uh, you know, it yeah. took you on a, on a musical journey right from the get go, you know, right. it uh, did. And again, you know, I point back to people like you that gave us a platform to showcase it. I mean, we were on major television shows playing this weird stuff, you know, but you couldn't deny it. It was that good. Oh, you know, playing virtuistic. A virtuistic, if I say. Yes. Yeah. 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 And my brother Roy on drums, wear, you know, wearing a pirate hat and this weird looking thing like it's from outer space. And you're wondering, where's the drums coming from? And Johnny Carson's a drummer. So, of course, he loved that thing. Hmm. The drum guitar, you know. And then we had Howard Levy in the first three albums. Howard Levy plays piano and harmonica. And Howard's doing stuff on the harmonica that is literally impossible, right? The harmonica is built leaving notes out so that you can just blow in it and get a chord. And you, you draw in, you suck in, and you get another chord. So it, le it intentionally leaves notes out so that everything you play is in key. But Howard said, hey, I want to play the notes that aren't in the key too. Why are you leaving out these notes? And some kind of way, he found them. He found these notes. So he can take one harmonica and play in all the keys. He can play Charlie Parker, Coltrane, and all kinds of stuff. So he's doing that and playing piano at the same time. So we're doing stuff no one's ever seen or heard 
it's an interracial band, right? Bass player is flipping through the air, spinning his bass around. You can't even find the drummer. And the leader of the band's playing a banjo. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah, got to stop in your tracks and say, wait a minute, what is this, right? And then you listen to it and it's good. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. 